Welcome to the Stranded Technologies Podcast. I'm your host and founder of Infinita Fund, Nicholas Anzinger. In this show, we talk about how to accelerate the future. Our thesis is that many life improving technologies are held back by institutional barriers. How can we unblock vast opportunities while mitigating against the risks? What ethical principles, rules, and regulations can guide us on that path? We will discuss these questions with entrepreneurs, policymakers, and industry experts. If you enjoy the show, please give us five stars and visit us at infinitafund.com to join the community. Today is September the 19th, and my guest is Silicon Valley-based serial entrepreneur John Chisholm. Over the last 40 years, John has founded, grown, or sold four companies in Silicon Valley, including Decisive Technology, now part of Google, and Customer Set, now part of Focus Vision. Today, John is CEO of John Chisholm Ventures, a startup advisory and angel investment firm. He has served as president and chair of the worldwide MIT Alumni Association and as a trustee of MIT and the Santa Fe Institute. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Most recently, he's the author of the popular guide to entrepreneurship, Unleash Your Inner Company, 10 Steps to Discover, Launch and Scale Your Business. John, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for inviting me, Nicholas. Today, we'll hear firsthand John's insights from studying, growing, and selling Silicon Valley companies. In addition, we'll get John's views on entrepreneurship as a stranded technology. More on that later. First, John, in your three decades of entrepreneurship, was there one experience or time that most shaped your life and career? Yes, there was actually. And that would be the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001. Uh, some of your listeners may not be old enough to remember that, but the internet first became commercially available and productized in the 1990s. During that time, billions of dollars were invested and over-invested in the internet. That led to the dot-com boom Companies like Amazon, eBay, Google were all founded during that time, but also tens of thousands of smaller companies that either you've never heard of or that we've all forgotten about. I'd started my second company, Customer Sat, during that time in 1997. Customer Sat did online customer satisfaction measurement. It was for large companies. It was a software as a service model. The Huge dot-com overinvestment peaked in 1999. You've heard the phrase, party like it's 1999. Well, that's where the phrase comes from. And that boom collapsed in 2000 and 2001, what's known as the dot-com bust. So in that first quarter of 2001, I would often wake up in sweat-soaked sheets sticking to my skin at two in the morning. Uh, our second round of financing, our Series B round, which had been long planned for that first quarter, refused to come together despite a flurry of meetings with investors as customer sat ran out of cash. Thousands of small companies all around us, like ours, were going out of business left and right. Those nights I would wake up, shower off the sweat, and try to get back to sleep. When my management team and I finally realized that our Series B round was not going to close. We huddled to figure out what to do. First, we cut our own salaries, and then a few weeks later, those of all of our employees by 10%. I cut my own salary by 50%. Agonizing and debating over every individual, we laid off 40% of our workforce, 40% of the company I'd spent the last three years of my life building. When I assembled our remaining employees to explain to them that this was the only way we could stay afloat and stay together, I felt my composure collapsing, and I broke down sobbing in front of our employees. They stood there stunned, sympathetic, and embarrassed that their CEO was crying in front of them. To help us get through, one of our investors lent me $300,000 for the company, but not to the company. But for me to lend to the company, meaning that I would be personally liable for repaying that loan. Later, I would repay that investor to whom, despite the arrangement, I was deeply grateful by mortgaging the townhouse that I lived in Silicon Valley in Menlo Park uh, to help uh, th that first 
quarter of 2001, our revenues fell by 20%. That's a lot for a software as a service recurring revenue model company. To help us get through or to help us make payroll, we factored receivables. That is, we sold our future receivables for cash today at a 20% discount, an expensive maneuver that you don't want to do routinely. To save on rent, we consolidated in the less attractive second floor of our building and rented out the ground floor to another startup. That company quit paying us rent after 60 to 90 days, came in late one weekend night, cleared out all their belongings, and disappeared without a trace. The nightmare would not end. I reduced my salary to minimum wage, the legal limit. Finally, we could see profitability ahead in the third quarter of 2001. And then, as you know, on September 11th, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center. The entire Northeast communications grid was down. It took an entire day just to confirm that all of our employees were still alive. Finally, the next day, I was able to issue an announcement, all customer sat employees are safe. Even though we were 3,000 miles away in Silicon Valley from the terrorist attacks in the Northeast, even in Silicon Valley, every company I know of had clients or customers who lost family members or employees through the terrorist attacks. If the dot-com bust did not kill a startup, almost certainly the September 11th attacks did. Well, we did not break even in that third quarter of 2001 or make a profit. We did break even in the fourth quarter. Uh, The going kept tough for the next two or three years. We didn't hire a single new employee for 18 months, but we made it through. And the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Often I wondered, why did customer sense survive when so many other companies and I think it's fair to say most other companies of our size and cohort failed. And it was that question that was a key catalyst in writing the book, Unleash Your Inner Company. And have you, what's your answer to the question? I definitely don't think we were smarter than other management teams. I definitely, we definitely did not have more in the way of resources than other management teams did. A customer sat only raised $2.94 million in its entire history. One notable company during that time, Webvan, raised $75 million in its, before its IPO, another several hundred million in its IPO, and then famously declared bankruptcy 14 months after its IPO. So we definitely didn't have more in the way of resources than other companies did. Uh, If I had to attribute it to just two factors, why we survived and thrived when so many other companies, most other companies failed, I would say it was this. One, we cared more deeply about our business than other management teams did, about all aspects of it, about the coolness of our products, about our relationships with our customers, and about each other on our team more than other management teams did. And two, We stuck with it longer than others did. As I mentioned, it was another seven years before the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Most other companies just gave up and threw in the towel before then. So in short, I would say it was this combination of passion and perseverance that got us through. Uh, Everybody talks about passion these days. That's starting to get boring. Some people are also talking about perseverance. That's more interesting. But no one is talking about how the two reinforce each other and form a positive feedback loop. Passion is an attitude. Perseverance is a behavior. And in many aspects of our lives, our attitudes and behaviors reinforce each other and form a feedback loop, either positive or negative. You know how if you just stick with something long enough so you start to get better at it and then start to like it and then get still better and then start to love it. That's an example of perseverance driving passion, creating passion. Conversely, if you're already passionate about a subject or an activity, you know how the hours can go by like minutes when you're engaged in that activity. That's an example of passion driving perseverance. So you can see how the two reinforce each other. 
and form a feedback loop. And if you can think of any aspect of your life where you've experienced that positive feedback uh, between passion and perseverance, that's probably a really good area to consider starting a company. Passion and perseverance, that's a good key insight from your journey. Another one is that entrepreneurship is a roller coaster, right? I actually had a similar story for me. The, that home crash was COVID for a company I used to work for. We were also at the same stage, the Series B. And in the wake of the COVID crisis, which more like resurfaced problems that we had before, we also had to significantly restructure. I wasn't the founder. I was a VP in the company and in the management team. And in the wake of that situation, I left the company. Many others left the company. And I think a big part of it was we had to redefine sort of the core. What is it that we're passionate about? And I think afterwards, the company was able to realign itself and find a different passion and recenter itself and also survive, which I'm very happy about. I had many friends from that time, but I also learned firsthand there how much of a roller coaster entrepreneurship is. I often say that in your areas of passion and perseverance, whatever they are, there are only two things you need to start a company and make it a success. Number one, a real unsatisfied customer need. And two, an advantage for satisfying that need relative to others who would try to satisfy it. And of course, there are millions of unsatisfied customer needs out there, human needs, even just in the areas that you're passionate about. And as I explain in the book, maybe we can talk about this further, you, each and every one of us, have millions of advantages, whether or not we realize it. The book gives you a way to inventory and catalog them. But the two, the customer need and the advantages, are like puzzle pieces, and they have to fit together. And so it's largely a process of search to find the two puzzle pieces, customer need and your advantage, that fit each other the best. It's an iterative process to refine both the customer need, to hone it to fit your advantages, and to strengthen your advantages by finding the right co-founder, developing prototypes, doing market research, increasing your learning, acquiring the right equipment and tools and so forth, uh, honing your resources and advantages so you can better address the customer need, and then finally narrowing it down to and selecting the single best fit between a customer need and you and your advantages. And that's the company that you launch and scale up in the 10-step process that the book lays out. Can you give an example for an advantage that you could have? Because many people might think, oh, maybe I don't have an advantage against other established companies that could do this much better than I could. The lady who cleans my house, Maria, and her two friends or co-workers that she brings with her, there's nobody else I would let clean my house. I trust her. She knows where everything goes. And she has a tremendous advantage, doesn't she? Uh, her business is modest by many standards, but I'm a satisfied customer, a loyal and repeat customer. And so she has a strong competitive advantage for house cleaning, at least for me as a customer. And similarly, each and every one of us have advantages that we may not realize. That One of the chapters of the book talks about the importance of being different than established competitors. Different is better than better is the name of one of the chapters. And some of your competitors will be much larger than you. Maybe they're Fortune 500 companies. Obviously, being better than them or trying to be better than them, i.e. competing along the same dimensions and trying to outdo them along those dimensions, is going to be really hard for your startup. But if you can find other dimensions along which to compete, maybe a different design or a different approach, different technology that you can use so that you're not directly competing with them, that will give you time and space to get established. You may not be the ideal choice for everybody, but as long as given the way that you're different, you're a better choice for some subset of customers as they buy from you again and again and tell their friends and colleagues about your product or service, then you can grow with them. It gives you a solid base from which to grow. 
So different is better than better. You asked me a moment ago, how did I get started in the first place? I like to say I had a great advantage in starting my first company. I was fired from my previous job. And uh, so I started looking for a new job. While I was doing that, I had a chance to do some consulting, marketing consulting. I did that. I gained some good experience. I made some money and I went back to looking for a job again. Then I had a chance to do consulting again, including for the company that fired me. I did that, made some money and went back again. But then another consulting project came along and then another. And then eventually I just quit looking for a job and I became a consultant and I evolved my first startup out of that experience. So that's the hard way to become an entrepreneur with no planning or advanced notice. Your listeners can do it a better way, which is to plan ahead while they still have a steady income, while they're still employed. And then what I recommend in the book is find, start with the customer need. Start with several customer needs, multiple customer needs in the areas that you're passionate about. And then test each of those against your resources and advantages, and then iterate, as I described before, and then narrow it down to just one. It's hard to do more than one thing well at a time. As I said, I recommend starting with the customer need rather than with the advantage. Why is that? I started my first company, Decisive Technology, with a really cool technology for which there was no market And it took us six to nine months to let go of that idea. I won't bore you with what the technology was. I had a patent on it, so I was eager to apply it. But it took six to nine months to swap it for something for which there was a real market need, namely the ability to do surveys on the internet. And so we pivoted from doing conditional voting, which was what my patent was about, to doing surveys on the internet. There's a lot of overlap. But of course, there's a lot more demand for surveys. That product, Decisive Survey, became a hit. And that it's that product, it's that company, which is part of Google today. So it really does work. Start with a real unsatisfied customer need, especially those entrepreneurs of us who are engineers. It's so easy for us to become enamored with the technology and just high and low for a way that it could be applied. And there are some new successful businesses that are started that way, but maybe only 10% of them is my estimate. The most of them and the most successful of them start with the customer need and figure out a way to do that. So in the 10-step process, I do have a step for, if you have a resource or technology, searching for a customer need for which it could be applied, but realize you're going to have to work extra hard to do it that way rather than to start with a well-established customer need, because it's really easy to fool ourselves into believing there's a customer need for a technology when there really isn't. And to satisfy the real customer need, you may not even need the technology or maybe use a different technology. And so you can address it much more effectively or economically some other way. Fantastic. It's also something I always ask when I talk to a startup that I want to invest in. What is the problem that customers have? How do you know them? Yes. Who have yes. you talked to? Beautiful. And what questions did you ask? Can you talk a bit more or give a bit of a gist how you would recommend anyone who wants to go entrepreneurship to What methodologies can they use to discover customer needs? There's a chapter in my book called Don't Listen to Your Customers, Discover Their Goals. So, of course, what I mean by don't listen to your customers is not to not listen to them, but don't take what they tell you literally. I use the example of customers who insist that the entrepreneur is interviewing. They insist they need a better mousetrap because they have a problem with mice in their home. But the mousetrap is a solution. It's a technology. And the entrepreneur is asking questions like, what if you could just keep mice out of the home in the first place? Maybe using ultrasound or chemical or some other technology. Wouldn't that be better? 
And this entrepreneur identified the real customer need is not a better mousetrap, but a way to rid the house of mice. It's a simple, perhaps subtle difference, but makes a big difference down the road because it doesn't focus all your attention on just catching mice, but opens up your mind to the possibilities of other approaches for satisfying the need, which is to make sure the home has no mice. So focus on, again, focus on the need rather than any particular solution, because the ideal solution to that need may be something quite different from whatever you're currently thinking. John, you mentioned the stars chart earlier. How does it play into this? First of all, what does stars stand for? It's the word stars with two A's and two R's. Your skills, technologies, assets, achievements, relationships, reputation, and strengths as in inner strengths. And these seven words represent all the different resources that you, the entrepreneur, bring to bear to start a new business. And something that's a really worthwhile exercise, whether you plan to start a new business or not, is to either take out a big sheet of paper and put seven columns on it, one for each of those words, or perhaps use an Excel spreadsheet, make seven columns and put one of those words at the top. And then underneath each word, write down as many of the resources as you have in your possession. Some of them are tangible. Some of them are intangible that you can think of. Your skills and technologies would include both those that you've acquired by formal study in school or on your own, or just because you're passionate about the activities. Your assets may be physical, they may be financial, they may be knowledge-based, a particular body of knowledge that you know about. Uh, your achievements are things that you've accomplished in any realm of life, because that will help build your self-confidence and achievement in one realm of life often spills over to other realms of life. Your relationships are both personal and professional. Either of those could help you in starting your business. Your reputation is how other people know you. And finally, your inner strengths are qualities like passion, creativity, perseverance, entrepreneurship, you name it. And whether or not the resources in each of these seven areas seem relevant to starting a business here or not, We'll put them down. It doesn't matter as much where they go as it does to make sure they're somewhere on the chart. And this chart we use in four different ways throughout the 10-step process. Number one, we use it to assess the fit between you and each of the unsatisfied customer needs that you've identified. How many of the resources on your chart are you, is the need able to use? Two, we use it to see where the gaps are. For each unsatisfied customer need you've identified, what additional resources do you need to develop or acquire to do a good job of satisfying that need? Three, we use it to innovate. And innovation is largely a process of combining things we already know in novel ways. This chart, the STARS chart, lays out everything you already know. And so you can look at the different items on the chart and look for combinations that might not have been combined before. You, the chart is almost certainly unique to you. No one else has exactly your same combination of skills, technologies, passions, relationships, and so forth. So you have the potential to create a completely novel business that no one else does. And finally, we use it to build your self-confidence because it's hard to start your own business. You'll run up against all the same obstacles and have to take all of the hard and humbling actions that I talked about earlier, cutting back salaries, laying off staff, moving to smaller, more modest offices, factoring receivables, and so forth. And having in front of you all of the resources that you have in your disposal can help build your self-confidence and get you through those tough times. That's the central role that the STARS chart plays in helping you determine what's the best, what's the ideal business for you to start. What I really like about your book, Unleash Your Inner Company, it's a rare book in that vein. 
it's not only geared towards technology entrepreneurs. It seems to me the lessons you give is applicable to any entrepreneur in any kinds of business, be it like a small mom and pop shop or a small business that you want to do, not just VC fundable startups. Is that observation correct? Was that your intention? Absolutely. And the fact is, I don't distinguish as in a black and white fashion between those two categories, the startups that are fundable by outside capital and the mom and pop shop, because so many huge enterprises today who got started as a mom and pop shop, McDonald's started out as a single restaurant, Costco started out as a single warehouse store, Starbucks started out as a single coffee shop. And if a really good first step is just to get your first customer and get paid by your first customer. In other words, deliver value to that customer sufficient that you can charge them something for whatever service or product you're providing them. And then after you have a core of customers, no matter how modest, then start thinking about how you can streamline, automate, and scale the business. And there are lots of techniques for scaling up. It's okay if you're not very scalable initially. The book shows you how to look at different business processes within your business and see how can you automate or streamline each of those. Uh, for example, if you currently provide customer service in your business through a staff of customer service reps, could you possibly reduce the size of that staff or even eliminate it completely by letting customers support each other and compensating or acknowledging them for supporting each other rather than incur the staff and expense and finance of handling invoices? What if you just deal with credit cards that simplifies and automates much of the process? So. This is one broad set of techniques. Network effects are also are another important way to scale your business. What do I mean by network effects? When the more customers you have, the more you automatically attract other customers. Network effects can either be one-sided or two-sided. A one-sided network is where there are one type of customers, and the more you have of them, the more other customers you attract. If a whole bunch of your friends are using FaceTime, then you're going to want to use FaceTime too because you'll have a lot of people that you can talk to and uh, you'll miss out on talking to all those people if you don't have FaceTime. Same thing with Facebook. Anyone can communicate with, potentially with anyone else on the network and the more people who are using it, the more it attracts other users. A different type of network effect is two-sided and that's where one type attracts another type of customers. For example, a job posting website where you have the employers and the potential employees who are looking to meet up with each other. The more employers there are, the more prospective employees that will attract. And the more prospective employees there are, the more employers that will attract. There's a positive feedback loop there. Whatever you can do to both create the reality and the impression of having lots of users who will attract other users, if your business model works that way, is one way to scale up your business. And if you look at all of the huge companies in high tech these days, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Netflix, all of them enjoy some form of network effect. And you can too. In the book, I give a step-by-step -step method for how you can evolve any business into one that enjoys some network effects. Those are some thoughts on mom and pop businesses versus those that are attracting capital. So you have been an entrepreneur over a long period of time, much longer than I have. What's your observation? Is it easier or harder to found a new business today? Or in what ways is it easier and harder? Well, in most respects, Nicholas, it's, in my opinion, it's easier. When I think back to my first company in the early 90s, We didn't have the internet. You couldn't very easily find suppliers and evaluate different suppliers for e either 
physical or software components for whatever it is you might be trying to build. Finding customers and reaching customers was harder because you had to use conventional means, phone, postal mail, fax. Today, with the internet, you can outsource entire departments, entire functions that are not your essential competitive advantage. Also, software development platforms are more powerful today. What used to take a team of a dozen engineers, software and developers, 30 years ago, might have required a team of six developers 10 or 15 years ago and might only need a team of two or three developers today. Uh, I remember how much work it was to take a credit card over the internet back in the mid to late 1990s. It's a task which is trivial today using the software development platforms that are available. So in most respects, I think, starting a business has gotten easier than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Of course, there's tougher competition, and that's something that, of course, makes it harder. But there are many more products and services on the market today than there were back then. And each of those products and services represents an opportunity that a new entrepreneur could address. The product or service itself could be improved in any way that you can meaningfully apply an adjective to make it better, uh, smarter, quicker, brighter, lighter, tastier, whatever. The companies that are providing new products and services have all kinds of needs that you might potentially satisfy. They have needs for marketing, sales, accounting, inventory control, analytics, and so forth. And three, often new products and services create needs around them. You know, a new mobile device creates a need for a new carrying case. Electronic vehicles, electric vehicles create the need for new, for charging stations. Uh, and there have never been as many products and services as there are today, so there have never been as many niches that could potentially be filled or consolidated by a new product that you might bring to market or service. There's just one sense that I can think of in which starting a business has gotten harder in the last 20 or 30 years, and that is regulatory compliance. I use the example of, in the book, of hiring contractors. 20 or 30 years ago, you could very readily hire somebody as a contractor in the early stages of your business for as many hours as you could afford and as many hours as they were available. And then as you started to generate some revenues or raise some capital and could hire that person for more time, you could increase their hours and then gradually convert them to a full-time employee. And that made starting a business possible by being able to ramp up your costs and expenses gradually like that. Today, it's much harder. The rules that govern whether you can hire someone as a contractor are much more detailed and complex than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And maybe it's they're enforced more strongly than they used to be. But now there's at least a six-page form that you have to fill out to confirm that each contractor is allowed to be a contractor rather than would be treated as an employee. And if those requirements aren't met, then you, the entrepreneur, have to deal with all kinds of costs and overhead to get started with that employee. Things like social security, unemployment, health benefits, so forth. It makes what used to be a gradual process of a smooth growth into a big step function that is especially difficult for a relatively new entrepreneur, or perhaps somebody who doesn't speak English fluently, who's new to the U.S., especially difficult for them. And there has been a well-documented, steady decline in the number of new companies per capita that have been started per decade over the last three or four decades. And 
I have got to believe that it's regulatory compliance that has made it so much more difficult. So I mentioned worker status law. This is just one drop in the ocean of regulations, but it's just one example. Every industry has its own regulations that are the most onerous of medical devices, the FDA, new drones and aerial vehicles, FAA regulations, software development. Perhaps most onerous is the limit on H-1B visas that limits how many software developers can be brought to the U.S. from overseas. Real estate development, all the laws and multiple layers of zoning and environmental protection, delivery services, a host of laws around transportation and state laws and city laws. I could go on and on. And to navigate this for a first-time entrepreneur or, again, an entrepreneur who's new from outside the country is just really hard. And we forget that most of the economic growth in the country comes from new businesses. Most of the employment, new employment comes from new businesses. Large established companies mainly grow by acquiring smaller companies. And so without the smaller companies for them to acquire, there's no or much less innovation and growth by the Fortune 500 than there would be otherwise. This really is important to raise quality of life and standards of living for everyone. And yet it's becoming harder and harder. You talk in your book about that trend. So according to studies by the U.S. Census Bureau and the Kaufman Foundation's the rate or the percentage of all businesses that are new firms have dropped from about 16% in 1977 to less than 8% in 2010. That is all new businesses. So proprietorships, retail stores, service providers, restaurants, consultants, that's not high tech. You, you talk in your book about how you can face these challenges as an entrepreneur complying with regulations. What's your take on how we can overcome those external barriers and increase the rate of entrepreneurship? So in the book, I offer some broad guidance to entrepreneurs. For any particular regulation, there are three approaches an entrepreneur could use. Simply comply with it, try to circumvent it in some fashion, or to oppose it and try to overturn it. And for the overwhelming majority of the regulations, the optimal approach or the right approach for the entrepreneur will simply be to comply with it. Because again, there are only a few things we can do well, and we have to focus our efforts and attention on, on our business. And we just have limited bandwidth to go out there and try to really change the environment. So that's the, the, the legal environment. So that will generally be the approach. But in some cases, for example, if a particular regulation is disallowing your essential competitive advantage from being brought to market, then the other two approaches, circumventing the regulation or opposing it, might be the best path. To circumvent it, I use the example in the book of a regulation that disallows vehicles. Could you remove the wheels from your vehicle so it could be treated as a structure rather than a vehicle and thereby pass muster with the regulation? Or conversely, if the regulation precludes structures, could you add wheels to your structure and turn it into a vehicle? So it, again, isn't addressed by whatever constraint the regulation is imposing. And finally, in overturning regulations, I use the example in the book of a nine-year-old boy in the Midwest who successfully overturned a regulation in his community. And if a nine-year-old boy can do it, so can you. So don't rule it out. There's also an appendix in the book Appendix E, which is called Making the Modern Regulatory State More Resilient, Humane, and Friendly to Startups and Innovation. And that provides guidance not to entrepreneurs directly, 
but to lawmakers and policymakers, how they can make their jurisdictions more friendly and attractive to entrepreneurship. And that has such guidance as don't make any new law or regulation longer than 100 pages. Because if it is, people won't be able to comprehend all of the implications and unintended consequences of that regulation. Two, make every regulation of limited time duration, say five years, and have it be required to be renewed explicitly by your city council or your state legislature or whatever after that time. So it's assured of being revisited. Another approach is require innovation impact assessment. You know how we do environmental impact assessments today. What if a similar process was required for impacting regulation? What new regulation, what new innovation could a new regulation possibly be a disallowing? Thinking through that process before putting the regulation in place would be very helpful. Yeah, I've been also thinking long and hard how to, these are improvements that policymakers would have to pass to improve the regular story state. I really like your idea of the sunset clause that you just described that regulations have an expiration date and then they need to be confirmed after an innovation impact assessment. After spending some time in Washington, D.C. and also having a background in public policy and knowing a lot of people who are working in policy, I'm not that optimistic anymore that these changes can that easily come about, which is why I'm now more interested in the option of special economic zones which is why I'm right now in the country of Honduras in Prospera, which is basically an exit option, right? It's a voluntary social contract where you operate under more flexible rules, more flexible regulatory options. So what would you say are the prospects and the hopes for improving the regulatory state in existing jurisdictions such as the United States, which is known to harbor a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship, but seems to be increasingly putting more constraints on entrepreneurs versus or how can the United States benefit from other jurisdictions that are coming up with more novel regulatory solutions? I really like the idea of regulatory choice. It has so many advantages. The United States has 50 states and many thousands of cities. If we can do things at as local a level as possible, either the state level or even the city level or county level, we can learn from each other. We can do experiments. We can see what works and doesn't work. Imagine, for example, if the United States had 50 different health care frameworks rather than one framework that is one size fits all for the whole country. It would have many advantages. One is each state could tailor their healthcare framework optimally to their own state. And two, the 50 states could all learn from each other and see what seems to be working and what doesn't. This incidentally is how Canada does it. The different provinces of Canada, each are responsible for their own healthcare policy and practice, and they can learn from each other. By having a one size fits all solution, it's there's no learning that goes on or a much slower process because we don't have any experiments like we could be having 50 different experiments. What you're talking about with special economic zones extends that same concept globally. And that's a great idea as well. Incidentally, seasteading extends it to the open seas, creating independent communities, businesses on the open sea and seeing what works in communities of perhaps hundreds or even thousands of people on ships and structures that are in the open sea. I absolutely support that idea and anything else that will accelerate our learning to see what is optimal for a given jurisdiction. Common law, as opposed to civil or statutory law, is in fact just such a learning system. Common law is not imposed from the top down. Common law emerges from the bottom up through the decisions of judges, through
throughout courts across a jurisdiction. Some 60 or so countries around the world, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Botswana, Hong Kong, and so forth, I could go on and on, have inherited British common law traditions. And if you look at these countries, they have enjoyed about half a percentage, a percent per year, greater growth in GDP per capita than the countries that did not inherit British common law traditions. The former colonies of all of the continental European powers, France, Germany, Portugal, the Netherlands, Italy, and so forth, primarily inherited Napoleonic statutory or civil law traditions. Interesting, if you consider the GDP per capita in the United States or in North America, which together with Canada has primarily inherited British common law traditions, Mexico, of course, less so, but overall GDP per capita in North America is about $35,000 per year. And in South America, which has primarily inherited civil law traditions from Spain and Brazil, GDP per capita is about $8,000 per year. I don't mean to suggest that legal traditions are the only factor at play here, but they're an important factor. Law has a lot of work to do in resolving disputes between litigants fairly and efficiently. And if we burden that important work with trying to set policy, which may or may not reflect the preferences of that populace, we're going to get worse results in many ways. And I think the lower GDP per capita that we've seen in places like South America as compared to to North America are one example of that. I know that you listened to an episode on your friends with Tom W. Bell, who spoke on my podcast about legal innovation, basically, and how law is, in a way, the software of society, and also about the difference between common law and statutory law. What were your thoughts in response to what Tom W. Bell said about innovation in legal systems in different jurisdictions using an open source approach? First of all, I find Tom Bell, Professor Tom Bell at Chapman Law School, uh, just a font of insight, legal insight. He's done a lot of work in special economic zones around the world. He wrote the book, Your Next Government, which is all about SEZs. And I really enjoyed the podcast that you did with him as, uh, as well and learned a great deal from it. Civil law does have its advantages. It's more predictable in the short term than common law, because you never know how a particular case will be decided. But if the rules are laid down in black and white in a statute, that provides short-term clarity. But in the long term, because simply a parliament or a congress or a chief executive or a dictator can set statutes and regulations and executive orders The law, statutory law can make bigger jumps overnight that you don't see with common law, which follows a much smoother evolutionary process. And I think it's worthwhile to consider all of the forces and impulses that drive governments, political leaders, and despots to create statutes and regulations and executive orders. Some of them are reasonable. For example, if property rights aren't well-defined or obvious, the the statute is one way to do it. How about noise ordinances? Uh, What maximum decibel level does someone have the right to enjoy or enforce and until what time of night? That invites a statute because there isn't a natural boundary between your property and mine as there is with land in sound. But other forces and impulses are less reasonable. Often there's a desire just to take action, any action, to show that the parliament or the despot is taking action. It's a form of virtue signaling. Or there's a need to appease vocal complainers. Or even worse, all of the public choice concerns that we know about, cronyism, federal agency risk aversion, and federal agencies trying to generate revenues. We talked about entrepreneurship in the beginning, as a stranded technology. Any technology can be held back from 
achieving adoption or scale because it fails to attract demand simply, right? Where you're saying it's a great technology, but people don't need it. There's many self-inhibited factors that hold you back from innovating, from going risks, from discovering your strengths, what you can ultimately be good at finding or discovering customer needs. For the same reasons, it could fail to attract sufficient investment to compete or a technology is just superseded by other technologies for good reasons, simply because other technologies are better, right? So fax has been superseded by email and messaging. But there's a third kind of stranded technology that is stranded or held back because of regulation or over-regulation, such yes. as nuclear energy, such as drone technology, such yes. as yes. many other areas that you mentioned, very complex labor regulations, for example. With this framework that we could also see entrepreneurship as being stranded in many ways or held back. We mentioned that entrepreneurship seems to be on the decline. And it seems to me that regulatory complexity and compliance could be one of the causal factors. And it's at least one factor that if we come up with better legal innovations can unleash more entrepreneurship, more innovation. We need to keep in mind that developing law is not ideally a destination or an outcome, but a process. Technologies are always changing. The economy is always changing. Society is always changing. So no law should ever be considered fixed and final. Or rather, it should be an attempt to better fit law to the needs and requirements of the society today. And realizing, as did the founding fathers, that will change uh, over time, and we need the flexibility to evolve it over time. So process rather than end result. John, you've been providing our listeners with tremendously valuable insight drawing from your long-spanning career as a serial entrepreneur and from your book, Unleash Your Inner Company, 10 Steps to Discover, Launch, and Scale Your Ideal Business. I think this is a tremendously helpful resource for any entrepreneur, not just a high-tech entrepreneur, but for any listener that feels the urge or the itch to create something new and different, or just to be more self-sovereign and being more the master of their own destiny and using business to channel that energy, providing customers with something that they want. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, John.